This 1972 Delta Unisaw was used in a cabinet shop in Tennessee for a number of years. At some point, the owner moved to Colorado and parked the saw in the basement of a lumber company they started. I'm sure it was used occasionally until the lumber business was shut down in the late 80s and the building was boarded up. Fast forward 35 years and overnight, a boarded up building is now worth a ton of money. The building owner decided to execute Order 66. Sorry, that's my best uh, Chancellor Palpatine. And they liquidated the entire building. I got there a little late, all the good lumber was already gone, but I did find this little beauty under three inches of dust, picked it up for a couple of hundred doll hairs, and now it's time to breathe some new life into it. If you're in the market for a good quality table saw for your shop, I don't think you can do better than a Delta Uni saw. They were made virtually unchanged for like 70 years, so finding parts is not a problem. They're also a good value. In dusty, crusty condition, they go for like two to four hundred bucks. New bearings and belts will run fifty-ish dollars. Clean it up and you have a saw that's ready for battle. In this video, I go a little overboard and paint the cabinet and a few other parts as well. It's not needed, but hey, I have the prettiest woodworking YouTube channel, so shouldn't I have the prettiest table saw? If you're wondering whether tackling a project like this is a good value, or should I just go buy a new tool? Well, I can't help you with that decision directly, but I can say that if I kept the work to cleaning the top, lube and everything up, and replacing the belts and bearings, this would be like a half a day job. If you're wondering if you have the skills and tools needed to complete this tedious task, well, just watch this video. If something isn't clear, which is not probable because my videos are awesome, but just in case, there is a comment section below and I answer every question. And while nearly everything I say is dripping with sarcasm, that last part's totally true. I do my level best to answer any and all questions, comments, fears, or concerns. This part here is the main arbor assembly. This is the only part after the cast iron top, of course, that would need to be removed to replace the arbor bearings. From a better vantage time. Shut up. To this point, pretty standard stuff, just taking things apart. I was hoping to remove the innards without removing the tilt and raise lower shafts. I couldn't make that happen, so I pulled them out and completed the disembowelment. I cleaned up all the parts with simple green and some scrub pads, and then I laid down some primer. I followed that up with a few coats of smoke gray spray paint. I don't think I'd make a very good tagger because my index finger kept getting tired. At this point, the case is drying, so I turn my attention to the internals. Uh, I was kind of done painting at this point, so I decided to save a bunch of time and just give everything a good cleaning. Brushes, scrub pads, and sandpaper mow down 51 years of crust in rapid fashion. This is the other side of where the main arbor assembly attaches. This is the part that the motor hooks onto. First thing is to drive out this roll pin, and for this I use a tool known as a roll pin punch. Having the correct size one of these makes a difficult job easy, and 93.6% of the time the roll pin can be reused. Much like my taste in music, this sucker was really frozen in time. It's funny, when I have to clean my house, that feels like a chore. But when I'm cleaning old machine parts, it feels cathartic. Which is why my table saw looks rad and my house looks like a Tasmanian devil tore through it.
Okay, let's get serious. Time to disassemble the arbor. After the lock washer and nut has been removed, it's time to remove the spanner nut. Probably not great to do this with a nail set, but it gets the job done. These can be replaced pretty easily, so I don't feel the need to be too careful. A couple set screws need to be removed from the pulley before I could knock out the arbor. So the pulley is trapped in this thing with a bearing on each side. I think this is a really good design. The only key is just to keep track of where everything goes. After smacking the bearing out, a quick inspection reveals that, yep, it was crunchy, all right. This is a bearing puller. It's the second type of puller I've used in this video. Neither of these tools are particularly expensive to buy, but if you don't want to go that route, pro tip, most auto parts stores rent these types of tools for just a few bucks. And in fact, there's actually one near me that will rent certain tools for free. Time for the new freshie bearings to go on. The interference fit of these bearings was really light, so no need for a press. When tapping a bearing in place, it's important to only tap on the friction fit part. In this case, that's the inner race. So I use one of the spacers to hold the pulley in place and a mix of other random stuff from the shop and I lightly tap at home. Okay, here's my favorite part of the whole video. Attempt number one. The part that I forgot to put in is literally in my hand and I continue to forget to put it in. So I slide this bearing in place and then I realize I forgot to put the spring washer on the other side of the whole assembly. So that's what I'm doing here. Okay, so it goes spring washer, then a spacer on top of the bearing that I put onto the arbor, then slide that into the pulley, then there's another spacer on the other side of the pulley that all goes through the bearing on the other side. And once everything's lined up, it actually slides together with ease. During attempt number one, I put the spanner nut back on. Then of course the lock washer goes on and the nut is tightened and then make sure to bend the lock washer to hold everything in place. I made this thingy out of 1 8 inch MDF. It should help with dust collection, I hope. So at this point the case is dry and ready for reassembly. If I disemboweled the saw earlier, it's time to re-embowel it now. Or should we just go with embowel? My guess is that if you lived in medieval England and you've been disemboweled, you probably don't have much bandwidth to consider which term would be proper English. Hence the predicament I find myself in here. I lightly bolted the trunnions in place, then moved on to the motor mount, which I found to be the hardest part of this whole deal. The reason being is that there's a spring washer on either side of the cast motor mount, so those need to be squeezed in place and lined up, then the main shaft goes in. Of course, butter and dry lube makes everything better. I wrap the arbor assembly back in place, and there's a square key that keeps this aligned as well. Time.
Time to address the surface rust on the top. I start with WD-40 and a scrub pad. This works fine, I do get some yardage. Here's a look at the pads that I'm trying. I think the green pads work best for rust removal. I also switch up to a product called Rust Free, which I assume removes rust and doesn't give out rust for free. Uh, it works better than the WD-40, but it's not a miracle worker. It still takes a few go-rounds and a fair amount of both elbow and shoulder grease. I also try out uh, a sander sitting on a scrub pad as well, and I think this is probably the best method. After maybe five or six rounds, the top is looking way less than 50 years old. Painting really opens a can of worms, because where do I stop? Let's take a wacky detour back in time to an era when the instructions for a power tool asked you to remove your necktie and roll up your sleeves. So let me get this straight. There was a point in time when a carpenter or cabinet maker wore a necktie and long sleeves to work? It's funny how things change. Anyway, that's the era of this tool, a Delta 1172 tenoning jig. This is actually a fairly sought after tool. I was lucky enough to get this one in a larger lot of tools that I purchased. It's heavy, accurate, well-designed, it works awesome. It also meshes well with the uni saw, but it will work on most other cabinet saws. Certainly not needed, but a neat tool to have in the quiver. Like many other tools from this era, the machining is really very nice. If you look at these parts, the castings are very complex, and then each have several machining processes to get them ready. Not to mention the exciting gray paint that would need to be applied at some point. Uh, even the base plate was machined. It looks Blanchard ground to me, but I'm no expert. Maybe it's time for a song recommendation. Since the saw is from 1972, why don't we go with a solid gold hit from 1972. Let's go with American Pie by Don McLean, though a close second would be Vincent, also by McLean. I know that song was technically released in 71, but it was popular in 72, so let's call it close enough and round up. It also had a rebirth when I was a young man in the 90s when American Pie the movie came out. So look at that, a uh, Farrington song recommendation also turned into a movie recommendation. Delta called these fiber washers, and of course they're no longer available. They're super important for smooth operation of tilt and blade height adjustment as they prevent metal to metal contact. I thought I could make my own washers from some 1 16th inch thick Teflon sheets which is about the thickness of the fiber washers. After punching a hole, I used the same Forstner bit to help complete the outer diameter at the disc sander. These don't need to be like machinist perfect, so this worked good enough and was quick. And after peeling off the leftovers, I had the six needed washers. Before I put this thing back together, I thought it would be fun to show how the lock works for height and tilt adjustments. These two little BBs are installed, and the locking knob has a point. As it's screwed in, it presses the two BBs apart, and that locks the shaft from rotation. Three hands would be nice when reinstalling all this stuff. Uh, it's not particularly difficult, however, all this stuff needs to be put back on in the correct order. This nut and locking collar get adjusted later to help take up any backlash in the raised lower handle. All right, pro tip, mark the threaded things relative to the shaft. They only go in one way, meaning they can be 180 degrees off and the roll pin won't go in. Nope. 
Okay, I totally lied earlier about the hardest part of this rebuild. This is actually the hardest part. There's already a collar on. It's held in with a roll pin next to Teflon washer. Then it's fed through here and another Teflon washer. And finally the threaded chunk. Now I don't mean to over egg the pudding, but it's only difficult because it's in a hard to reach spot. And I was trying to stay out of the way of the camera. Now I don't want to brag and try not to be too impressed, but I'm doing this without looking. I'm laying on top of the saw in a very attractive way, reaching my arms down blindly and completing this tedious task without using any four letter words. Always a good idea to polish your knobs. After getting all this stuff back together, I was pretty happy with how smooth it was, so I tilted it back and forth like 50 times. I reinstalled all the badging, which was either held on with tiny screws or little itty bitty rivets. These punched out easily from the inside and seemed to hold well enough after reinstallation. Time for the motor to go back in. This sucker was heavy. I didn't film this, but I put new bearings in the motor. Wait a minute. I did show this on my glorious Instagram feed, which you should go follow. Changing out motor bearings is exactly similar to what I showed earlier with the Arbor. There's a pin that the motor pivots on and a slotted bolt hole for belt tension adjustment. I just let the weight of the motor tighten the belts. I don't know if this is correct, but it seems to be working thus far. Now this shot clearly captures me lifting the motor and feeding the belts over the pulley. The first thing all Unisaw owners did in the early 70s was paint flowers on their VW buses. The second thing they did was remove and trash the motor cover. There's a company called Bell Plastics, unfortunately not a sponsor, that make a few different things for popular cabinet saws, this cover being one of them. New wiring and new hardware are installed on a freshly painted switch box. I know, I know, I agree. Anything worth doing is worth overdoing. At some point, the switch box was installed in this lower position, which I liked because it keeps it further away from the hand wheel. I got this off eBay, and I think you'll agree, this rug really ties the room together. At some point I picked up this uni fence for the princely sum of zero dollars. Yep, someone was just getting rid of it. On the surface, this seems like the best table saw fence ever. It has a high-low setting. It can be slid forward or back, depending on what you're doing, which is neat. But either I have the world's strongest thumbs, or this thing flexes as much as Arnold at a Mr. Olympia competition. Now it's time to get experimental. Over the years, the Arbor flange has just gotten a little chewed up. This was also used in a professional setting, so there were probably a million kickbacks on this saw. So uh, with all that, there was a little more run out than I would prefer. It's hard to measure accurately, but it seemed like it was more than a thousandth, maybe even approaching two thousandths of an inch. So I thought I could get it a little closer. I used the tilt and the raise lower to take a bunch of very slow and shallow passes. I also buffed the flange with some sandpaper just to clean up the roughness. The end result was run out of maybe one half of a thousandth of an inch. Again, it's hard to measure. Even just pulling on the belts uh, causes a thousandth variance. Uh, but when I put a blade on, it's certainly running smoother than my Powermatic saw. So that's pretty good. I also picked up this sliding table attachment for a couple hundred bucks. This is the second one of these that I've owned over the years. I thought I would just tease this a little. Maybe I'll do another video where I install this and build a Robusto outfeed table. Well, there it is, restored back to its former glory, ready for another 50 years of faithful service. Here's a nickel test. 
Not bad for a lighter table saw. Time will tell if I keep the uni fence and what comes out of the sliding table and outfeed setup. But for now, I hope you enjoyed following along. Thank you for watching. Till next time.